So uh, actually there are, oh, it's too far. Uh, there are percentages, how much you remember according to that, how you absorb the information. So if you're just listening, it's somewhere between zero and 10% what you remember from that, what you, what you hear. On the other side, if you try to teach others, you will remember about 90% of that what you are teaching. So the basic is you can see how asymmetric the situation here is because if you try really just to listen, you won't remember anything from that what I'm talking about. But me, I will remember 90%. So uh, there's a slight provocation from my side. Uh, I would really like if you don't take anything from that I'm talking about for granted. Uh, just don't believe me. Ask questions about everything I'm talking about. Consider it's not right. If you try just to discuss or quarrel with me, we've got a chance that we got somewhere to 50% of that what we are talking about. It's maybe a little hard, but it's how it works. So for those who still remember how they studied, you know how it is. If you're just going through the books, it's nothing special. If you try to take a beer and quarrel with your friends about some topics, you will recognize after some, after some weeks or months that you still remember that. But the books are already lost. Uh, if we try to, to go to the history, there was a lot of uh, national handball schools. It was Germany, Yugoslavia, Sweden, Russia, former Yugoslavia, of course, which was rather similar to, to Hungary. But actually, Handball changed in the last decade or two decades so much that actually the, the players moving all around Europe or worldwide even and mixing and who is, who is still keeping the typical national technique? I'm not sure about it. It's taught, for instance, uh, here, Chris. Exactly, I just wanted to say it's taught here in Croatia. But actually, if you see the top players and top keepers, they are perfectly prepared and they are crazy. So, what you see the guys doing in, in the goal is. It's amazing. Uh, I, I'm sure about it that the preparation, the physical preparation of the, of the goalkeepers improved in the last two decades tremendously. And the mental preparation improved as well. In my opinion, there are still some national schools and uh, besides Croatia, I'm not sure, maybe Hungary is slightly similar. But the rest of the world is just so terribly mixed. If you just take the goalkeepers of German team, you are here. Wolf and Silvio Heinefetter. <laughs> they are so different. They could be from, from another galaxy, it's not just from our national team, you know. And uh, I'm pretty sure the basics may be taught according to some model or, or pattern on, on some mostly historical school, but the development goes to where the individual goalkeeper is used to or where is his vision or where, where is his potential, his opportunities just to develop and to, to be the best. If I talk to, to the guys there, I don't care too much how you do it. Just save every ball. 
And uh, obviously the technique will be different for the tall guy, for the short. The question for me is, and it took me a lot of time to, to come to this conclusion, what is the right technique I should learn my goalkeepers when they are 8 or 10 or, or 12? Because if they got matured and, and maybe they are 14 and they've got holidays from the school and came in September back to the training and they are 7 centimeters taller and now they, uh, their body doesn't behave like they expected because everything changed from the biomechanics. And the biggest problem is, or there are two in, in my opinion, one is the loss of confidence because the young player who was very strong in May comes in September and nothing worse with his body. So it's a terrible feeling. And the second point is, if you try to change the motion patterns at the age of 14 that are fixed already, it's pretty tough. I'm not sure, maybe you manage that, maybe you lose some time, maybe you lose some potential, I don't know. But through the years I, I learned to try to fix a lot of individual moves but connect the technique with perception and decision making all the time. So that actually the goalkeepers got a very wide portfolio of basic movement that got automated and just use the highest criteria we mentioned before, no goal, just to select the right movement. If you do that in the face from six, eight, ten years up in the faith that there is no pressure on the result. You can develop in, uh, in the training a very wide portfolio of moves and they are very natural and they are connected to the game. They are connected to perception of the space of the ball and with the decision making. They are not connected to me as a coach standing there and crying make a move like that, it was a shit, make it like that. Because I run the risk that a goalkeeper will play in the goal as I will, not as he will. And the problem is, he will go to some alibi, say, okay, I'm moving as the coach told me, so I'm doing right. Maybe I've got saving efficiency from 15%, but I'm doing according to the coach, so I'm fine. So actually losing a lot of potential of the goalkeeper's head, of his motivation to look for his way, how to do that, how to save. It's, it's not easy for a coach not to train, you know, to prescribe how to do that but just to give the impulse and let the goalkeeper just seek his own way. I am a terribly impatient man, you know, so I know how hard it is, but I learned to know that is the best way how to open the development up to the late years. You'll see later on some examples of goalkeepers who are learning tremendously with 35 years. It's, it's, it's fascinating. So I'm pretty skeptical about, uh, about a specific national school so it's been 20 years ago, something like that. There are some very good basics, but I'm pretty sure that each goalkeeper who wants to be the best one will see his own way. If you try to name 10 top goalkeepers in the world, maybe we'll agree on 10 names, but I'm pretty sure each of them will be totally different, or not totally, in some situation, maybe. But they will just be the best of, her, of his or her potential, of his body shape, how tall they are, how explosive they are, how mental strong they are, all of this mixed together 
will make the image of the goalkeeper. It's funny thing that in, in goal you can compensate a lot, incredibly a lot. You've got guys who are over two meters, perfect in coordination. You are shorter guys. I played rather successfully goal for a long time. Nobody knew how terribly slow I am. I explained nobody when I was active player. I told after that one coach who's got a bad luck to to experience it was uh, was Rolf Brack in Germany, who is a very scientific guy and, and rather. Uh, crazy guy, uh, eager to try new, new things all the time. And he's been professor in university as well, and coaching the, the Bundesliga team. And he measured the explosive power of the players just uh, through apparatus. We are jumping over some hurdles. And the apparatus is measuring the time you spent on the ground and compares with the time you spent in the air. The more time you spend in the air, say, if you are more, more explosive, very short on the ground, very long in the air. We make this exercise, and Rolf look on my results and say, Mike, it can't be. I'll run it once more. So I did it three or four times, and he just pegged his apparatus and took the, uh, to the university to recalibrate it because he didn't want to believe the results. I told him, Rolf, I'm, I'm very sorry, I, I am so slow. I can't do anything. So, so I, uh, I started to play a real top handball with 24 and I have no white muscle fibers. So what should I do? I'm just playing a goal as I can. Sorry for that. And I told nobody, and okay, it was fine. I was anticipating a lot. I was sometimes provocating the opponent so that he loses his confidence. It was fun. But actually, it was no top athletic performance. It was maybe sometimes top goalkeeper performance, but not from the L. I like it all the time. So I say from, uh, from that point of view, you can compensate a lot of terrible things in, in the goal. If you are able to manage your defense so that the defense can cover your weak points. And of course, you shouldn't talk anybody about it. How the technique comes together. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of techniques, a lot of successful techniques. Uh, I'm not sure if they are unsuccessful techniques. I don't think so. There may be some patterns. They are not successful. They should be corrected if it becomes a behavior that that opponent can can use or misuse. But uh, for me, uh, the critical questions about, about uh, goalkeeping technique is which is correct? When I, uh, and how can I land the correct one in the right time? How can I match the technique to my biomechanics, to my uh, physiognomy? Because uh, the, what I mentioned before, the young players are developing all the time. If I fix something that doesn't fit their body shape when they are 20 or 25, I've got a problem. So how can I keep the, the technique so flexible that it can develop? One point that is terrible for goalkeepers is uh, the development of the throwing technique on the wrist of the, of the field players. Of course, connected with, uh, with the glue that makes them to, 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 to do terrible things with the ball that wasn't possible 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And that's another important point that you have to develop the technique with the game. 
I've got a pretty silly situation uh, a long time ago uh, in that time where the spin from above this one was very rare and actually uh, in that time only Alexander Kashakevich from Russia was able to, uh, to shoot from here the spin. A lot of players were able to make the spin when they go mid and down and, and turn the wrist like that, but he was in that time the only one who made the shot, the movement like for, for a stride shot and make the spin from, from up. And I was lecturing somewhere in, in Denmark for the coaches and I talked about anticipation and how important it is to handle the information about the opponent for the, for the, uh, for the goalkeeper. And I said, for instance, this shot is very rare, so you know this guy knows that and these guys know that you can forget about the rest, so, so it's fine for you. And we went to the practice, there were some uh, 16 years old guys practicing, and from eight wings, six got this shot. I was like an idiot, you know, <laughs> but that's it. And you have to change your technique with that. Because, uh, I don't know, you mentioned just you that, that you are a goalkeeper, but for instance, it is totally changing your technique, saving from the wing. Because if you are used that if the ball is here, he can't spin, you just position it wrong. If you just use that if he wants to spin, he had to put his hand here. You've been fine last year, but now you go with the hand down and he make this backhand shot over your, uh, over your chair. You see like idiot. Spectators laughing. It's pretty hard to stay in the goal. It's at least my experience. So you have to, uh, you have to develop all the time as well. And point that is extremely important is how to stay unpredictable in the goal. As the goalkeepers are studying the field plays on videos or oh no, it's not videos, you've got a computer and say, okay, I want Lars Christiansen over against Heimer. How he shot in last 100 games in the last 10 minutes of the game. Tuck. In 10 seconds you've got a result and you can study that. Of course the field players study the goalkeepers the same way. So if you've got a fixed patterns in fixed situation you are lost. And the guys are pretty good. So what they can do with the hand it's it's amazing. Actually, sometimes I'm quite happy I don't play anymore because <laughs> it's, it's really hard. So, how to stay unpredictable? And how to keep the standard? Because you are seeking for new patterns, for new moves, for new techniques all the time. And you have to select and throw out the, that one that's not working before the opponent notice that say, okay, in this situation he behaves like that, I will use that. But against other player, with, again, uh, with different jump, with different timing of the throwing arm, maybe this technique is working. Maybe, maybe not. So, to make it sure, how can I save even the incredible walls, that's the question. And for me, uh, the point that is extremely important, I repeat it once more, you can't do that like your coach wish that you do that. Because you lose your idea, you lose your, uh, your imagination, your potential just to make game your game. I'm pretty sure about it. You can help the young players to a to, to certain level, but if at certain level you don't get a feeling of 
of the crazy guy who forgot his body because he just wants to stop the ball and he doesn't care if it's uh, uh, dangerous or not. And sometimes it's pretty dangerous. Then, okay, maybe it's a good standard, maybe it's a league standard, but it won't be the, the international top goalkeeper, I'm pretty sure. Uh, this guy is one of the, of the best ones. That's one of what I mentioned. It's amazing for me how he's developing and learning all the time. How old is he? I don't know. He's the same in the last 10 years, something like that. 38 or something like that. Maybe even more. Are there differences between male and female goalkeepers? What do you mean? Are there any? I don't know. I'm just asking. It's not bad, no? To be frank, I don't see too much differences on the top level. On the middle level, yes. On the middle level, there's the typical difference on the physical preparation or on the power or explosive power, jumping power and so on. But on the top level, okay, some centimeters, some arm reach, but actually in the techniques, not so much. Maybe the, the most extreme crazy guys, as Silvio Heinefetter, for instance, don't have exact pendants in female handball. Maybe it's because uh, the women are not so crazy as men, because, of course, Mankind has to survive, so someone has to be reasonable, and uh, for sure they are, uh, the ladies they are more reasonable as the men, mostly. Not all the time, but mostly, in average. But I don't, I don't see too much differences between, on the top level, in the techniques between, between ladies and, and men. Do you? Let's talk about the, the basics. What are the basics of, uh, of the technique? For me, it's one important point is the physiognomy and biomechanics, so the arm reach mostly and, and the body area. Uh, handball became so fast that uh, if you have a big body that can cover a lot area in a, in a goal, it's mostly advantage. If you are able to move the body uh, appropriately in the goal, there are for sure some disadvantages if you are too short, especially in, in men handball where really the field players are able to jump much higher, and then it's it's really a disadvantage. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, you can compensate a lot. Uh, another important point for me is uh, core stability. As I mentioned uh, in the praxis, is the uh, is the source of self-confidence if the keeper is is strong in, in his core. Because if you are not strong here, you can't make a fast move with your legs or with your hand. If you are not uh, very strong here, 
try to lift the hand so the body will go like that. It's just balance. If you are strong here, got a strong muscle. So you've got a fixed point and you can move very fast. The same for legs or even more because they are heavier. So that's very important uh, point. If you consider how the top goalkeepers move, definitely strong core is a protection from injuries. So if you see how they are flying and falling on the ground and getting in touch with the, uh, with the field playing fast break who jumps into the goal and try to shoot over your head and then jump is and you collide in the air and fall down, it's pretty hard. If, if you are not uh, really strong, you won't survive too, uh, too long, in my opinion. Okay, motor activity, which is, in my opinion, a very connected to mental constitution and, uh, and to his temperament. If, you are, uh, if you've got a goalkeeper who's very phlegmatic, some years ago almost all top Russian goalkeepers were just standing there, funny thing, Igor Chumak. I never seen a fast move of him. He's been always on the place where the ball was. I don't know how he do it. But uh, it's connected to the, to the mobility, to the motion as well, to the, uh, how they display the, the, the temperament, the, uh, the mind. And of course, uh, it's limited or developed by by the mental abilities, perception, imagination, decision making, all of that. But I'm pretty sure in two days handball, you can go with, let's say, classical way with very nice fixed technique. But if you are not crazy able to take very fast decisions and to do something which is unpredictable, you don't reach the stars. You stay somewhere, maybe very, uh, very nice and very, very good level, but you won't get this killer instinct when you just change things. It's, it's uh, actually a very, very nice uh, reward for goalkeepers because to be open, only an idiot will go to that area, stay there, and the other guy shooting the balls of half kilogram. 120 kilometers on your head. It's, it's not normal. But a very nice reward is that you can really change things. If a goalkeeper just shut down the, the goal, the other team can do what they want, they will lose. And you know the situation, you got a feeling that the opponent team is scared to shoot because they lost all confidence and in the situation they are free with the ball on seven meters and playing another pass, just not me. You know. There's, there's a funny thing, in, in that point uh, a goalkeeper is something like a zero in roulette, you know. It's out of the system in changing the rules. It makes some people terrible set at the end of the game. <laughs> but that's how it, how it works. So perception, observation, space, time, and understanding of, uh, of the game. That's for me uh, a very important thing because you can anticipate, you can predict a lot in the goal. You can predict according to uh, the throwing arm movement, the timing, there are not so many people who can change the, the timing of the throwing arm. It's not so easy. You can sometimes change the movement on the direction, but to change the timing to be very fast, or then go as a lot of left-handed players do that, that the elbow goes forward and then comes the hand afterward. It's, changing the timing for the goalkeepers because it's changing the key points you are synchronizing on on the movement of the opponent's body. So that is another point when you can change the game and actually 
you see a lot of guys in, in the top handball in the, in the last decade who really, they don't speculate, but they gamble and they are able to prepare their opponent to do exactly what a goalkeeper wants to do. It's a very, it's a very nice case. It's actually changing the idea of handball and attacking players and defending player who is doing that according to how attack is, uh, is acting. And the goalkeeper is the poor guy behind just to improve all the mistakes that, that, that happened before. And it could be changed in the, another way that me as a goalkeeper, I decide what will happen on the court. And I see the opponent coming. I know there is a young guy who is maybe under, under pressure because he's just fighting for, the, for his new contract. Or experienced guy who's coming back after injury. And I don't know he uh, haven't got any successful game before after the injury. I can say to my defense, OK, let this guy shoot or prepare special, a special situation where I know exactly. I just started a computer, ta, 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 ta. I know it. 85% in this situation, he will shoot like that. So I will prepare through my defense, I will prepare the situation for him. So I'm just changing the whole game. I'm deciding what's allowed to happen, not the attack. It's very interesting to, to, to see handball and the role of the, of, the, of the goalkeeper like that because it's another dimension of the game. And funny thing is that if you've got good defense, you can persuade that, that exactly that game makes sense. And they expect support from you and they are ready to work for you as a goalkeeper because they believe what you said is correct and that makes sense for them. So actually, you make the life for the defense easier because you say, okay, if you are positioning like that, eight and a half meter is enough because the rest I've got is a backcourt player against him, just go against the hand and then push him slightly, go away, I will shut down the goal. They just say what will, what will happen and what will work. So they are happy to do it for you if you show the performance and if you show your passion to fight for every ball. If you've got it in the goal, it's a nice game. Really it is. So let's come slightly more to, to the hard facts. Some of you have got physics on the basic school. I've got something about physics. Uh, I've forgotten a lot of that. But, but I remember one thing. If you want to move some object, you need a fixed point. And the power goes from the fixed point through the heavyweight point of that object and it defines the direction of the movement. If I take a goalkeeper, so the fixed points are standing on the ground, the fixed points are my tiptoes and the body heavyweight is somewhere here in my belly. The principle is if the goalkeeper is standing like that, so that's approximately the heavy point and the power vector goes from, from the tip of the, of the foot and we can uh, divide this power vector to the vertical part and horizontal part. The vertical part is responsible for jumping up and the horizontal part is responsible for moving my body to the side. Unfortunately, I seldom reach the ball, so I really have to move to the, to, the, to the side. So if we just decompose the power vector here, it's the vertical part, and the horizontal part is so small if the position is so narrow. 
and you know from our own experience, if you from that position try to move sideways, it's not so easy. If you take a wide stance, the situation changes slightly. There's a heavy point of the body. There's a power vector if I want to jump off my feet. And there are the vertical part and the horizontal part. So you see that with the wide stance, the horizontal part is much bigger than it was in the case before. Yeah. So with this position, I can move much faster to the side. Of course, if, I, if I've got so wide stance, I sacrifice some height. But with the guys, as Arpar Sherbik with two meters, something like that, or Andreas Wolf, two meter two, or something like that, you actually don't sacrifice too much because the guys don't fit into the goal. So if you sacrifice something, go very wide, so it's maybe 10 or 12 centimeters here. But the movement to the side is extremely fast in this case. Of course, you have to take care about the area between the legs, for sure. But the movement to the side is extremely fast. And the reach of the guys is ex uh, extremely long as well. So that's the reason why it's very difficult to be in today's handball a top goalkeeper if you are short. Because not to sacrifice too much of your reach to, to uh, upper corners, you have to have a narrow stance. If you've got a narrow stance, you are not so fast in a sideways movement. If you go deep and be very wide, you sacrifice too much, maybe you don't reach the upper corner. So that's the balance you are, are going to find. That's it. The other point is one hand safe or both hands safe. Is something correct or what you prefer? One hand. Why? I'm just asking. I'm just provoking. You said you've got both hands, you've got two hands, but if the ball is here, what I do with the other hand is just... Yeah. That's correct. On the other side, how many players are able to use the wrist if they are under pressure? If the block is not passive, but the block goes active forward, so just shortening the time. I'm just asking. A little, but enough. Okay. You see, what is enough? 15% or 10 or 40? I don't know. Funny thing is, and uh, that's exactly the point, that there are a lot of goalkeepers who just swear on one hand. There are many goalkeepers who swear on both hands in some situations. All of them are very good or top. I'm pretty sure it's, it's against one of the things that's connected very much with the self-confidence and even risk management, you know? Because on the other side, uh, the, the arguments you mentioned are totally correct. On the other side, I could say, okay, uh, this is a perfect example of perfect one-hand save. But 
if there is block touching the ball or if you don't see exactly the ball because it is just a uh, stem shot somewhere between the three players. It could be dangerous because one hand has got the small areas, so just to miss the ball is a big chance as if you go with two and on the other side, if you really, and it's uh, totally correct, if you go with both hands in one corner and the ball goes to the other corner, you are like an idiot for the people, you know. And to stand in three or four times in a game to look like an idiot for 20,000 spectators and, and uh, uh, 200 million spectators on, on TV, it's rather hard, exactly. But there are guys who can survive that. Silvio, I never I know how this guy. You, know? you are running fast break, and he's got his head here, and his foot he's, uh, he's got in the upper corner. And you say, what does it mean? But he saves often enough to make you insecure, and if a goal gets scored, he doesn't care, he's confident, he's, he's safe. Other guys can't be safe. I can't be safe like that, just gambling, you know. But he's not gambling, he just took that as a part of his, of his movement, of his technique, and he's very successful with that. So, uh, here's another picture. It's almost perfect. No? He's covering with both hands. There's food there. No much space. Under the foot, okay. Again, what's amazing for me, there's no one perfect technique in that. And consider what you can do if you are changing the technique. If you can handle both in different situations. So again, you are, you are in particular for the opponent. It's pretty hard in, in training because you, you must be crazy enough, crazy enough to, uh, to practice more to get all these patterns into your portfolio of, of movement, for sure. But it's pretty nice if you, if you manage that. Maybe there are some pictures. We can see a lot of the guys we talked about Two meter two from the coordination, pretty nice. It's easy, no?
that was incredibly safe. Now it's in slow motion. <laughs> you want it one more time? It's fascinating, yeah? <laughs> it's, it's very nice how things they are actually really impossible. You watch in, in all games and the guys are, are able to, to, to make performance like that. It's, I'm pretty sure it's part of this is a is a really physical preparation uh, that is just leaving the classical technique and the mental preparation who, uh, which which makes a guy makes just things like that. It's it's fascinating from that point of view that if you are able to practice for that, your team will see it in the training. Big part of that what we've seen is just the trust and respect that you fight for every ball. And then you can build up such a confidence that if you make safe like that, the team will work for you as well very hard. And, and you know, uh, of course, they are just uh, a nice moment, uh, but without sound defense, you can't survive as a goalkeeper. 
you all the time just speculating and, and treating your defense and the opponent and just working with probabilities and just look on the timing and how the player is moving to the defense and what is covered and you just check out options that are not possible for, for him to work. And then at the end, if you are smart enough and patient enough, you maybe come to that one shot he has to do right in this moment. We'll talk about it uh, later more uh, uh, to tomorrow uh, when uh, we talk about it, how it comes that you can really sort out the perfect shot and a goalkeeper is there. It's working like that, it's a, uh, but uh, it, it has been worked through in the training. And the signal must be given to the team in the training that you are working like that. Uh, some, some years ago, I, I talked to Philip Icha about the time he was in Kiel and where Tite Omeye was in Kiel. And Philip told me, he's not perfect all the time. There are uh, some games when he just from the statistics, from the analytics, he's really poor. But we know he's training in this game. He's just practicing. He's uh, trying new things. And we know pretty well when we need him. When he plays against Barcelona and finally against Flensburg, something like that. He will be there and he will save. And that's a level of trust you have to work for years and years on just to get it and to be connected with your name, with your personality. And then you've got a trust of your team, of your defense, and the opponent is afraid of you. It's actually the best you can manage if you just play in the goal and you've got a feeling they are just scared to shoot on your goal because you know you will save anything. So if, if, you, if you experience something like that, once or twice in your life, so it's fine. How to come to the, to the analysis? Unfortunately, we don't have, or fortunately, we've got unified analysis in uh, IHF and uh, EHF and Olympic Games since some years. Uh, some years ago, uh, it was different and it's terrible. On the other side, uh, the saved goals, uh, the, the saved balls against the goal scored is nice, but I, I'm not just satisfied too much with that because what's the importance of the goal? How you count a shot from 10 meters which is half blocked by, uh, by the defending players just jumping into the goal area, you got it. Compared to fast break, when it's 23, 23, three minutes uh, to the end of the game. So it's, uh, it's difficult. And, uh, another thing that is difficult for me uh, and it's not reflected in the statics, statistics we've got now, is if you take a typical situation, very important game, teams fighting just up to the level, trying to, to allow no risk to play very safe, you've got a chance on a, on a breakthrough, fouled, the goalkeeper saves, referee whistles and calls a free throw. So the opponent uh, plays again. There is a wing on three meter angle. Uh, goalkeeper saves. A referee calls for penalty. Penalty goal scored. So from these actions, you've got actually one goal scored no successful save in the, uh, in the statistics, which doesn't reflect the situation on the field. 
because the goalkeeper saved twice before and maybe you saved your one minute to play. So uh, it's uh, not so not so clear, but uh, okay, it's the best we've got. But I see more important the inner statistics and inner analytics of the goalkeeper based on what is my vision, what is my goal, where do I want to go, where do I want to be in two years or three years or five years. And in my opinion, uh, the goalkeeper must have the vision, must have a master plan how to come to the goal. It was a very precise analysis of my own strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and to work with that. As I mentioned before, you can compensate so much in the goal that the opponent maybe doesn't need to notice that you've got some weak point on one game or maybe you've got some injury you don't want to, 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 uh, to make public. And it works, really. So, uh, for me, this is the structure of the master plan in long term. And then and I can build up my training program with keystones, just say, okay, at that time I'd like to be there. I'd like to manage that and working according to that. If it's on the, on the body shape and it's positioning and the most important thing, in my opinion, is the mental toughness uh, Inge mentioned here. It's pretty difficult because uh, I used to, to ask a question, I do it again. What is, in your opinion, the biggest difference between goalkeeper and field player in the game? Any idea? What is the biggest difference? Everybody start. No idea. In my opinion, if a field player is not in a good shape, and he's an experienced one. And maybe he hadn't scored from two very nice actions. He can wait when he go, goes one-on-one -on -one and go into the gap, and he's not confident to score. He can put his hand to the opponent and provocate a penalty or something like that, or, or wait for, for a free throw at Louis just not to lose the ball and wait for the chance when he feels confident to score. Or maybe he doesn't need to shoot, just open the gap and play, uh, play the pass for, for, for his team and uh, to score. So, as an experienced field player, you can survive the situation when you don't feel confident on the field. As a goalkeeper, it's pretty tough. Hmm? You can stay there and, and uh, the start of the game was one fast break, second fast break, foul, penalty, goal scored, big winkle from, uh, from the side. You've got four goals, no save. And you can't simply stay there and say, fuck, this ball is too hard. I will let it go and I wait for the next ball, maybe it will be slower. <laughs> you can't do anything like that. You must be there and go for the next ball so enthusiastically as for the first one. Even if you, after 15 minutes, you get no success. And it's pretty hard. And it's pretty hard to come back to the game. We've seen there, there are a lot of pictures of the 
Pardar from, uh, from uh, Barcelona, who actually saved the game Barcelona against Kiel in last year. He just saved everything. And actually, Kiel had so many chances and played in the field better than Barcelona. So that's the hard part of the goalkeeper's job. To stay tough and to stay focused and stay confident, even if in the 12 minutes you've got one ball saved and seven goals scored, and you stay there. What will happen in the, uh, in the another 45 minutes or 48 minutes? It's on you. It's your job to stay focused, say, okay, I'm strong enough to save the next ball. And if it doesn't happen, to wait for the next, say, okay, I'm confident enough, I will save it. That's the hardest part. So the mental shape, the focus, the, uh, the confidence and organization, inner organization, to be aware of my strong points, of my preparation, as, as uh, Inge mentioned, the preparation is the base of my confidence because I know what I've done for the success. It's a huge part of that. And I myself uh, experienced several matches when I was extremely poor. And actually I saved in the whole game five balls. But I was fighting for every ball, and the defense, so I'm fighting, so they fight it for me. And at the end, we won with two goals, and all spectators were happy and say, okay, it was a nice game, and the defense was perfect. Yeah. Everybody was satisfied, and I knew I saved five balls in the game, you know. But what you display, what you show to the opponent, what you show to your teammates in the defense, is sometimes much more important than just a one point in the statistics. Because it builds the trust for the future. It's it's very hard things to do. Okay, uh, the other things are tactical preparation, opponent uh, information. It was interesting what, what Inge says here about the Russians who just focus on their strengths and said, okay, I don't care who is my opponent today. <laughs> I will just play my game and I will be successful. And of course, the mental stability and the risk readiness. How you manage the risk on the field? Sometimes there are situations that you have to just select from two shitty situations, the one you have some, somehow feel it could be better. No one can help you in that moment, only the result will show if it was correct or not. If you're playing 28-28 and you need to win, in the last minute you save a ball and two wing players are sprinting for a fast break. One is an experienced one, the other is a young guy. Where will you pass the ball? To the experienced one. Okay, if the position is similar, you can you can choose. <laughs> you you play in the center. <laughs> no, it's it's at the end of the day, it's your decision that could decide the match. It looks simple. Uh, most of the goalkeeper would say, okay, I will play the most experienced one in that situation. But what happens in the experienced one just failed two times and the young player is just hungry. Slightly changing. Eh? I, I don't know what is correct. Uh, there is no correct answer. 
correct answer will be if you play the pass and the player will score, then you are the king. If you won't score, you are an idiot because you will take the bad, bad decision. So simple it is. Is anyone ever of of this book? Have, have anyone read this book by Jeff Corwin? Talent is overrated. I can really recommend it. It's very nice. It talks about about uh, some study of uh, psychologist uh, Anders Ericsson. Anders Ericsson was working with uh, Musical Academy in Berlin and was trying to learn why some of the music students were extraordinarily good and some of them has been just average. And with the help of the professors of the academy, they just make a big survey of, uh, of music students of the same age, they've got a similar program because they've been studying the, the same academy. And they've been solo, uh, following about 28 parameters just to find out why some of them are really stars. And they find out that the only parameter that was important and, and correlate with, with the quality was how much they practice in summary to that, uh, to that age. The stars where the professor said, okay, there are people who will be real international soloists and, and stars. They made more practice. The, uh, in that time, it was uh, they, uh, they just divided the students in, in two groups, in, in three groups, and the first group got a summary of the exercises that they practiced was about eight and a half thousand hours summarized up to the age of, of 20 or something like that. And the average got about 6,000, and the poorest uh, said it was about three and a half thousand. They found out that the best group was ready to change and adopt their uh, social life and their daily program to the practice. They practiced early in the morning when they've been fresh. They went to the school. Then in midday, they practiced new, got a rest, have some personal things, and in the evening, they practice as well. And uh, Anders Ericsson generalized that to, to a theory that became famous, uh, so-called 10,000 hour theory, uh, which says, if you want to achieve master level, you have to practice at least 10,000 hours. Funny thing was that when he came with his study from, from, medical, uh, from musical students, expert from uh, many branches called him and say, hey, in my area of expertise is the same for, uh, for medicine or for chess playing, but they say uh, in chess, you never can be uh, the master if you don't practice chess at least 10 years. So it, it became generalized like that. If we take it to, to handball and you try to just decompose the 10,000 hours, it's 20 hours a week for 50 weeks a year in 10 years of training. Funny thing is that some of the guys we'll see tonight are working like that. And they are really good. So it's just the point 
uh, about uh, okay, it's, it's, it's slightly simplified, but it's, it's, it works like that. And it was an impulse for a lot of more and more studies uh, based on that. And other psychologists came with some information that was not so easy to absorb, but they are actually summarized, uh, summarized that, that not every practice is counting. It must be a practice you make on the border or over the border of your comfort zone. Not that I manage something, so I'll do it in sleep and okay, after that it will work, no. Each time you have to try to go out of the comfort zone and look for the solution, learn, fail, and learn, and fail, and learn again. The other point is how you can speed it up is that you involve many senses into the training, into the practice. So the imprinting you've got through the practice is distributed through many senses, haptic, visual, uh, through your ear, and so on and so on. And extremely important is the last point, that you have to get feedback during the practice from a trustworthy person that will help you to make you sure, okay, this works or this, uh, this doesn't work, take care, do it like that. So, to make it short, you have to use your time really efficiently, then it's working. There is one tremendous save I laugh. It's, it's amazing. How you practice something like that? It's incredible. So uh, that's for me the point that goal thinking is not about technique, it's about passion. Simple like that. Thank you for your attention. Any questions to that? One small question. Uh, what was the per uh, purpose to put the field players in the goal? We didn't see anything. I have a feeling you lose the tie. And uh, it was like exercises for the children. Uh, exercise? Exercises for the children, you know, when the small... Uh, no, the, the reason for me uh, is in uh, two areas. Uh, mostly to show in the team uh, how hard the goalkeepers has to work. In a lot of the team, the players think, okay, I'm running, so I'm really working, and the goalkeeper is just standing there because he's too lazy to do anything, you know. And we've seen one of the first exercises, we just try to play the ball and stay relaxed. You say it was exercises for the children. The guys, I mean, how old? 15, 16, something like that, yeah. Some of them got problems with these exercises. And what we are talking about is to perceive the space, handle the ball, and to stay relaxed. Or oh, actually, if you talk exercises for the, uh, for the children, you are right. Uh, I used to do these exercises from seven years up to the national team.
the same one. Just for the reason, with the small children you develop, with the uh, top-level guy, you give them confidence. If you try this ex exercise and stay relaxed, you got a tremendous feel feeling on confidence because you stay relaxed, you save your energy, but you handle the ball very safely. It's a very nice feeling. Why well, put uh, the, uh, the field play there? Just for that reason. Just to make them aware that you make two spins or make a fool from the goalkeeper. Does it mean we are so much better working, so much better? Yeah. So, and, and the basic exercises, for me, doesn't uh, take any role. It's uh, a goalkeeper or field player. Okay, then the positioning goal, but it's slightly we are talking about just feeling of my body in the space, nothing more. Thank you for the question. Uh, any question more? Remarks? If there are some more, we've got two sessions more in the morning, so you can save it for for the morning. Thanks for more for your attention. Thank you, Michel. Then have a nice match, have a nice evening. We will continue tomorrow in the morning.